Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Once again, we are here today on our Thursday episode of the show, our Training Thursday show. We're going to talk today about blood sugar. All right, so today's show is going to be dedicated to the many questions I've had come in over the past couple of weeks on what to do for people that are eating well, but they're still having a bit of a blood sugar spike after meals. So today's show is going to be centered around uh, designing the meal, especially around a particular uh, macronutrient around protein and when to time it during the meal and also what proteins to have. So this one uh, came from our IHP community, really talented integrative health practitioners, helping people all over the world with their health. If you ever want to meet any of the integrative health practitioners, there are thousands literally all over the world that can help you with at-home lab testing. They can help you with protocols. They can help you with your questions and you can find them at ihp.coach forward slash practitioners. Or if you want the fancy long website, it's integrativehealthpractitioner.org forward slash practitioners. You can find wherever you're located in the world, or you can narrow down by their specialty, whatever works for you. Okay, so let's get into it. A lot of people dealing with blood sugar issues, they're doing their best through diet, through exercise, and they want to be able to improve those glucose levels after meal. Those are called what's called postprandial glucose levels. That's all. It means how much does your blood sugar rise after you eat? So I did a podcast on this uh, too, actually, specifically related to my testing out of a continuous glucose monitor. So those are called CGMs, continuous glucose monitors. You may have heard about them. If you haven't, you will. Uh, they're becoming much more prevalent in our population. The reason is that you no longer need a doctor's prescription. Remember, uh, companies like Nutrisense that I uh, worked with for my CGM, and I will link up, why don't I link up those two podcasts? Because that's important. I gave you a lot of takeaways on that show that I'm not going to go over today because I, I did those. So if you head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2225. Uh, I'll link up those podcasts. Really, really important. And then, of course, um, we have discount codes if you ever want to try out a CGM for a month yourself. Uh, again, no pressure on my end, of course. But if you ever want to see what your blood sugar is doing all throughout the day, after meals, during the night, you're welcome to check it out. And again, you can also just use a $20 at home glucometer. But if you don't want to, you know, stick your finger, uh, six, eight times a day, you're welcome to use that CGM. All right. So here's what I want to share with you though. This is really, really important that the way that you design your meal can actually improve your overall glucose levels if you're sensitive to carbohydrates. So that's what we're going to go over here today. When you're designing a meal, you have three main macronutrients to look at. Those are your carbohydrates, your fats, and your proteins. Okay. Your fats are not going to vary wildly with what happens to your glucose. So let's talk about those first. The issue with fats is if you have a food that is fried. Fried fats, meaning like, let's say it's anything breaded and fried. Okay, fried chicken, uh, I don't even know, fried fish, fried anything french fries, anything that has been fried and soaked in oil, right, and it's become highly inflammatory and it's high in fat, can actually spike your blood sugar at the meal, if taken with a carbohydrate especially, and keep your blood sugar levels for like high for like three or four hours. So that's really the worst thing that you could do is have a fried food that also has carbohydrates with it, such as bread or 
um, French fries or something like that. Okay. So just, again, you can bake French fries and that's totally different, but we're talking about deep fried fried food, right? That's what we're talking about. So besides that though, you have an avocado or olive oil or olives or nuts really not going to affect your blood sugar to any great degree. And it's not going to have a dramatic effect on your carbs or your protein. All right. So don't overdo your fats. That's for sure. I'm not saying that at all. Cause that will actually, that will it doesn't impair it. It can slow digestion in some way. Just simply, you need to be able to break down all that fat. That's all. But you can eat healthy fat at a meal. And I'm obviously an advocate in any of my nutrition meal plans. I'm always adding healthy fats to those meals. And of course, you know, the healthiest fats that I'm always recommending because I'm always talking about them. All right. So the next thing we have to look at is your carbohydrates. All right. So let's look at your carbohydrates. What do we have? We essentially have, let's make it really easy. We have starches and we have non-starchy vegetables. Well, your starches are going to be what? Okay. Those are going to be more of your potatoes. And that could be yams. It could be sweet potatoes. Yes, sweet potatoes are, of course, a little less glycemic. But let's just say in general, all right, we're looking at corns and grains and potatoes and yams, anything starchy. Okay. Those are the starches. Those are the things for susceptible people will raise their blood sugar. As I showed you on my CGM, if I have oatmeal in the morning, my blood sugar doesn't spike. Um, if I have rice uh, at night, my blood sugar is not going to spike. It's going to go up to a normal level and come right back down within 60 minutes or 90 minutes. I'm not susceptible. But again, as a clinical, as a clinician, as a clinical practitioner, I have to work people, work with people who are just not like me. That's a good thing, right? We work with a whole world. We all have our own issues. That is not specifically one of mine. Now, did I have type two diabetes diagnosed back in the day? Yes, I did. 17, 18, 19 years old, right around there, I was diagnosed with that. Why? Well, I failed a glucose tolerance test, which is basically drinking a glucose-based solution. It's somewhere around 72 grams or so of glucose. Um, and then you have your blood drawn uh, basically before, during, uh, an hour later, two hours later, and you see if your blood sugars come back down. In fact, it's technically an hour later, two hours later, three hours later. If it hasn't come back down three hours later, below 126, you're diagnosed uh, typically, at least back in the day, uh, with type 2 diabetes. Now, oftentimes, you typically would have a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 or higher. Anyway, I digress. But there's different ways of looking at it. Either way, I couldn't handle uh, glucose back in the day. I can now. And again, that's why there's hope for everybody, right? If I can heal, trust me, with my genetics, you can heal as well. So here's what I want to share with you, though, that starches are not the enemy. Fruit is not the enemy, right? None of these things are the enemy that has more carbohydrates. But initially, when you are trying to rebalance your blood sugar, and I have a show on this as well on essentially how to transition off a low-carb diet, is you do have to start with predominantly vegetables, okay? So I'll link up my podcast uh, on how to transition off a low-carb diet. That will be at stephencabral.com forward slash 2225. Because initially, and for us, it's about three weeks. So uh, this is on the functional medicine detox that we do, and also in the first phase of fatlosity, which is our clinically proven weight loss system. Uh, both of them are essentially vegetable only. So it's vegetables, right? So lower glycemic index, uh, lower total net carbs, more fiber. And the reason why the fiber helps with blood sugar, of course, and the lower net carbs in the beginning allows for us just to balance the body. Then after that, we transition in some of these healthy, lower glycemic fruits, and then eventually we transition and some starches. And we just walk you through all of that. It's, it's very step by step. But initially, again, the starches can increase blood sugar if your body's more susceptible to it. Now, let me tell you one more thing about carbohydrates, though. Your body will be more sensitive to carbohydrates if they're taken in after a workout. So if you love your name, it whatever, like you love your gluten-free pasta, well, do a workout before an hour after your workout, you have your meal. Like if, again, if this is for weight loss, fat loss, then you'll have some uh, gluten-free pasta if that's what you enjoy, right? So you add that in or it's made from chickpea, what, whatever you're into, right? Your carbohydrate of choice, your starch of choice, maybe it's fruit, maybe it's a smoothie. Okay, you're doing that an hour after your workout, great. So you put that in there, your body's going to be much more receptive to be able to, and I should say your cell receptors are gonna be more, receptor, more receptive to soaking up that glucose because you've hopefully lowered your glucose levels during that workout. 
your liver glycogen stores have become depleted or at least partially depleted. You're going to fill up those glycogen stores. Your muscle, if there was any glycogen depletion there, you're going to fill those up as well. Uh, and then the excess, of course, would then move to body fat only if those glycogen stores were not met and you didn't need that glucose to actually bring blood sugar up to normal level. So that is that uh, with our carbohydrates. And I will say that, again, if you're susceptible, it will spike your blood sugar after your meal. The spike isn't the biggest issue. We know that now. The issue is, is if your blood sugar does not come down within two to three hours, and coming down is a normal range is between like 75 and 95 on any uh, at least US-based glucometer and continuous glucose monitor, okay? So 75 to 95 is our sweet spot. It can go all the way up to 140, 145 after a meal. A lot of people say, oh no, that's terrible. Well, maybe, maybe, again, not always, because again, you have to look at hormonal balance. So does that spike help leptin ghrelin? The answer is yes. Does it actually help with um, telling your body that it's not starving? Yes. Can it help with uh, sympathetic nervous system dominance and moving you more to the parasympathetic? It can. Can it help to decrease cortisol? It can. Like it, So it can help with serotonin? It can. So we have to all, everything's not black and white. That's all that I'm saying. There's everything is essentially shades of gray and that's what we're looking at. And that's what we're talking about. So that's why I don't give individual or I don't give individual advice based on just silver bullet based approaches because they're not true, right? They're true for an individual, but is that individual you? We don't necessarily know. That's why we nuance this out on the podcast. All right. So this brings me to my last macronutrient, which is protein. Okay. So I said this before, if your glucose levels are not great after a meal, you could be lacking fiber, which is from your vegetables, or protein, which is from vegan-based sources, sources such as beans and legumes and dal and all those great things, right? Or if you like organic sprouted tofu and other items like that. Again, I'm not a huge advocate of soy, but for... Um, uh, postmenopausal women and, and a couple times a week in a small amount. Maybe. I'm just not a huge fan of soy in general, uh, but that, that can work. The phytoestrogens could actually be beneficial for some postmenopausal women, not on hormone, uh, biogenetical hormone therapy, etc. Okay. But your vegan-based choice, hemp hearts is my favorite one uh, for plant-based protein. Uh, and then, of course, protein powders, like plant-based protein powders can be uh, excellent as well. And then we also then have fish, we have eggs, we have uh, poultry, we have meat, anything like that can be your protein. Okay, so most people at a meal, let's say you're eating three meals per day, are missing protein at one of those meals. And that can lead to a spike in blood sugar after the meal. So, for example, most people don't eat any protein to start their day at breakfast. Again, like I can go back and forth. If we're talking about an endomorph body type, we're trying to get more to a catabolic nature rather than anabolic nature, you can make an argument for that. But if you have blood sugar dysregularity, you're looking to regulate your blood sugar, there's a lot of research and a lot of science that says your first meal of the day, whether it's at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 10 a.m., whatever it is, should have protein at it so that you don't spike your blood sugar to start your day. Now, it could simply be a smoothie with a something like a daily nutritional support protein in there, right? And with your, all of your vitamins, minerals, and all that, or your favorite brand. But you're going to want to get somewhere between 20 and 30 grams of protein per meal, three meals a day. Because if you look at that, that's only 60 to 90 grams of protein total, right? So if it's 20 times three, you're at 60. If you weigh 120 pounds, that's the bare minimum. And that's saying you don't weight train, right? You really need about half your body weight in protein daily as the minimum starting point. And then if you're weight training a lot or you're an athlete, you can go up to about one gram per pound of body weight. And I usually say that your ideal body weight is, right? So if you weigh 250 pounds, you don't need 250 grams of protein because if your goal weight is 180, you might need that. But again, I'm not even saying that much. I don't think people need that much protein. You need protein, but you don't want to go overboard. And I've talked about that before with longevity-based podcasts as well. There's also interesting research that shows that we have to be careful with the type of protein we take in, especially if you're prone to blood sugar spikes. And the reason for that is that Believe it or not, red meat and some processed meats show that they can actually spike blood sugar after a meal. I know. Again, I'm not against red meat. I'm not against, again, like people think that I am. I'm not. I'm just unbiased in giving you the truth, meaning that 
Um, you want to stick with grass-fed, leaner-based varieties. Uh, you want to stick with more of a uh, you know non-processed meat. And those are going to be healthier for you. Should you eat red meat every day? I know a lot of people are. I can tell you for sure from all the unbiased research that I've done, I don't think it's a good idea. I really don't. I would, I just, I always give the same advice to you that I would give my wife, my two young daughters, my parents, my family, my private wellness clients. I would not make the bet that eating red meat every day may or may not cause cancer heart disease and other issues. I know people say, well, there's so many studies proving that it happened. Listen, there's so many studies proving that it does, right? So there are some showing it doesn't and there are some showing that it does. The problem, or the reason why is because some people are susceptible and some people are not. Do you know if you're susceptible or not? That's the question that I ask you. Because if you know that you're not susceptible, then good to go, right? But how do you know you're not? That's why we need to err on the side of caution, my friends. We need to err on the side of caution, right? Do not play roulette with your life. That's all that I'm saying. I eat some red meat. There's no doubt about it. When I eat it, it's grass fed and I do enjoy it. I have no issues with that. I try to stay more plant-based, but for longevity reasons, but meat is more anabolic and will certainly help you more uh, with muscle building and transformation. Can you do it on a vegan diet? Yes, you can. I work with vegan bodybuilders. I work with vegan athletes. Uh, I work with vegan I mean, all sorts of vegan people. I've been vegan myself in my life. It just didn't work necessarily for my body. So anyway, I don't want this to turn into a vegan or not vegan debate. I fully support a vegan lifestyle. Many of my clients are vegan. Many of the celebrities and other people that I work with are vegan, and it's great. I have no issues with that. I can help people be healthy on a vegan-based diet. What I also want to help people is not on a more of a carnivore-based diet saying, that's not healthy, right? That's just not. It's too much. Anyway, so just be careful that all of the meat in your diet isn't spiking your blood sugar. All right. So now we know about how much, uh, again, how much fiber, about 10 grams per meal. All right. Might need a little bit more. Men uh, should be at about 35 grams or more per day. Women about 30 grams uh, per day. You can always get a little bit more. Now, protein, 20 to 30 grams per meal. You might need a little bit more that's up to you. Okay. No problems at all. It's very easy to get very, very simple to get. So now the, and, and how simple it is, is that remember there is some protein and the other foods most likely on your plate, especially if you do include some starches. Um, there is, uh, about anywhere between five and seven grams of protein per ounce of protein. So if we're talking about animal based proteins. So if you look at that, you only need about what? Four ounces of protein. That's literally smaller than my fist. Okay. Four ounces of protein will give you times six, 24 grams of protein. So it's not difficult to get right. Not at all. All right. So the last piece I do want to share with you though, is that, uh, well, so let me just add one more caveat. Plant-based proteins did not show an increase in blood sugar. I I just sharing with you the research, and I will certainly link it up for you. It doesn't mean that you need to eat all plant-based proteins, uh, but that is what the research is showing. And and again, so what I typically say is maybe make uh, one or two of your three meals plant-based and one of your meals, or maybe even two if you're eating three a day right now, uh, more fish or uh, a not a non-red meat. Okay. So fish can be a great one to add in more of that Mediterranean based diet. So the last part is this. Let's say you're doing everything right. You've got your uh, all sorts of veggies. You've got your healthy fat. You're adding in just a little bit of starch, like a half a sweet potato. And, um, and then you've got your protein for the meal. And yet you're still high blood sugar two or three hours later. What do we do? Well, one is we need to make sure that you're exercising in the first half of the day. That's without a doubt. Your body needs to rev up the metabolism. You need to use up some of that glucose, make your cells, make your body more receptive. If you haven't done the 21 day functional medicine detox, you'll do that. If you haven't, or if you want to do the first phase of fat lossity, highly recommend that as well. They're both, they both fantastic. You can find them at stephencabral.com forward slash detox or stephencabral.com forward slash fat lossity. That's simply F A T L O S S I T Y. And, um, and you can check them out again, wh- whether the, you want to uh, engage them or not is totally up to you. But then in terms of your meals, I am a fan of food combining. I can link up some of my shows on food combining. We'll link those up at stephencabral.com forward slash 2225. But what I want to leave you with is this, is that there is 
good evidence right now that if you eat your protein first, you will have less of a glucose spike after the meal, and it may may come down uh, that much quicker as well uh, because you don't get the spike initially in the first place. Uh, this has to do the research that I'll link up with you as well. Let me see if I can just pull it up here. Uh, I had so much linked up uh, previous to this. Well, I'll link it up in the in the research, but um, it essentially involves uh, post meal glucose responses and specifically. Uh, a glucagon-like peptide, which is GLP-1, that does not allow for as much of a release and even need for a release of insulin uh, and glucagon. So if we don't have as much of a glucagon release saying, hey, break down more glucose, uh, or we don't have more of an insulin spike, we're better able to balance overall blood sugar. So at least in the beginning term, or, or before you start to work on other food combined, and if you have blood glucose issues, you'll probably want to consume your protein and your veggies to start. So that could be like, let's say you have um, some wild salmon and some asparagus on your plate. Great. You'll eat those to start the fiber from the asparagus, and you'll get the protein from the wild salmon. Maybe you put a little olive oil on your salmon, a little rosemary for some antioxidants. Sounds delicious. Maybe some squeezed lemon, even better. And then after that, you'll have your maybe half a sweet potato or a little bit of wild rice or something like that that you might choose to do. So that is a way to not get that glucose spike. Give it a shot. Once you start to balance things out, you might even reverse that in the future. Remember, your physiology right now is not necessarily your destiny, right? So that works both ways. If you're in great health and overall uh, physiology right now, meaning like how your body works, uh, if you don't keep up with it, well, that can change in the future. And if it's not great right now, well, the good news is you start doing the right things, you start rebalancing your body, you can change that and believe it or not, just 12 to 16 weeks. So this isn't an overnight fix, right? But the, the protein trick actually can be an overnight fix. But the overall goal is to actually change those cell receptors, improve the overall health of your body. And that just simply takes about 90 to 120 days. It might seem like a long time right now in the moment, but trust me, three months is going to pass either way, right? Might as well start working on your overall health. So hopefully this has been helpful. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you. If it has been helpful, do feel free to share it with anyone you believe it could serve. Thank you, everyone. I want to sincerely thank you for your support of this podcast. I couldn't do it without you, and I mean that. I truly do. I also want to make sure you knew that we now have multiple ways for you to find your answers to the most difficult health, wellness, weight loss, and anti-aging questions. You can find podcast-specific topics like thyroid, adrenal, hormones, sleep, digestion, Ayurveda, and many more at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts that will then link you to your favorite Apple, Spotify, and other podcast players. Plus, all new podcasts and weekly exclusive video content is being added to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Stephen Cabral. And that's Stephen with a PH. Head on over and subscribe so that you don't miss any of the exclusive content. Lastly, if you've ever found any of my podcasts or books to be helpful, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a review on iTunes or your favorite media player for the podcast. Rating and subscribing to the YouTube and podcast allow me to reach more and more people and help spread my mission of healing throughout the world. Thank you again for being a part of this movement.